Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope everyone can hear me okay. We'll put thumbs up to make sure you can all hear me okay. Great. Good evening, everyone. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Torb and I'm the director of the Malcolm Foundation UK. Thanks very much for joining tonight's speaking event in collaboration with UK Lawyers for Israel. You're in for a really fun interactive evening, so I hope you have lots of questions ready for our special guests. Before we get onto the event, I would just like to say a big thanks to our sponsor, 3D Solicitors. Your support is very much appreciated. I would also like to thank UK Lawyers for Israel for collaborating with us, and you'll get to hear from Caroline at the end of the event. Finally, I'd like to thank our guest speaker, Rob Rinder, for making tonight possible. Now, before I introduce Rob, tonight is in honor of the Malki Foundation, who empowers families of children with severe disabilities in Israel by providing them with therapy and equipment to live at home. I've been with the Malki Foundation for nearly three years now, and I've seen firsthand how this small charity makes such a massive impact on the hundreds of families we've supported over the years. Through supporters like yourselves, we've been able to provide consistent therapy to severely disabled children, which has given some children the ability to lift a cup of water themselves and the other children the capability to walk for the very first time. These small things to you and I have not only changed the children's lives, but also their families. The following short video of an Israeli mother, Sarah, and her son, Aaron, and one of our therapists will tell you a little bit more. Okay, sorry about that folks. I think there's no sound on the video. Apologies for that. So basically that's a video of one of the parents that we support and her child and the Malky Foundation provides them with, with funds to, to make sure that they, they can help get the therapy that they need. So uh, their child is able to walk and get the consistent therapy. And that's what the Malky Foundation is all about, providing therapy and equipment to children who are very severely disabled to try and help them live a more in, independent, and, and um, fun life again. Um, but like so many other charities, COVID has had a big impact on the Malky Foundation, both here in the UK and in Israel, with all our live events and challenges being canceled. Fortunately, we have been keeping things going by putting on events such as these, and we still get daily requests from families asking for help, and we are not able to help everyone, so our waiting list is unfortunately growing and growing. But with your support from events like this and hopefully beyond, we will be able to help more severely disabled children in Israel. So from myself and everyone at the Malky Foundation, thank you very much. Now, thanks to everyone who has submitted a question for tonight already. Uh, we will be coming to you to ask it. So please bear with us and we'll find you and unmute you. Uh, we will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you do have any questions during the night, please raise your hand by uh, pressing the button here on Zoom. And, and again, we will come to you. Or if you like, write it in the text box. So uh, please don't be shy. Now, on to our special guest, uh, Rob Rinder. Rob is a barrister turned writer and broadcaster. In 2014, while still a practicing barrister, he began starring in his reality court show, Judge Rinder, now in its eighth series, and uses his legal knowledge working in the media to make the law more accessible and understandable to the public, regularly appearing on shows such as This Morning and Good Morning Britain. Alongside Rob, he has also presented shows including Judge Rinder's Crime Stories and The Rob Rinder Verdict, as well as hosting his own BBC Five Live series, Raising the Bar, aiming to demystify the legal system. His participation in series 15 of Who Do You Think You Are retraced the story of his Holocaust survivor grandfather 
and received critical acclaim. Following this, Rob embarked on an emotional journey exploring further his own family's Holocaust stories, resulting in a two-part documentary, My Family, The Holocaust and Me. Along with his screen work, Rob has published Rinder's Rules, which provides a thorough guide to everyday legal issues, including sections on jargon busting, consumer rights and common mistakes. He is also a columnist for The Sun and the London Evening Standard newspapers. We are thrilled and grateful to have Rob with us tonight. I would just like to start by saying hi, Rob, and welcome. And thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight. Uh, the last time I saw you, you had a couple of whiskeys on the go, uh, taking part in our, our whiskey tasting evening. So um, how That's are right. you? Well, Chaim, I'm still inspired by our last meeting. And I thought I'd carry on that, that tradition. You know, we're um, at a time of uh, challenge and darkness. One of the things that I love most and I share most about what it means to be part of the Jewish community is the delight uh, of Simcha, that the threads of our history isn't one just of tragedy, that represents the smallest part of it, and I reflect about that as we come to Pesach. And Rob, I've got a very large echo in your room, we've got some technology problems over it, I feel like I'm in an echo chamber. Uh, perhaps, so. you're, perhaps you're in a bathroom of some description, as long as it's well done up, that's the main thing. I'm in the okay. kitchen. Oh, well, uh, I don't, hopefully it's, I turn the volume down a little bit. So, no, no, I, I get these things all, all, all the time. Don't, don't, uh, don't worry. How, how have you been over the last year? How's lockdown been going? Uh, I'm, I'm fine. I feel like I'm presenting the uh, Eurovision Song Contest um, somewhere nebishy in 1972. Douze point. <laughs> what? Yeah, do you want to mute me and I'll cap mute me and I'll carry on? Yeah. Hello? Yes, yeah, okay. Um, this always... is like talking, this is like talking to my bubba by virtue of a satellite somewhere flying across the world. We, we... I don't know what's going on. We, we, we've done many of these and we've never had that issue before. Never mind, we shall, we shall push on through anyway. Yeah. I was saying, you know, um, one of the things I love, um, and I mean that word in the truest sense, about being Jewish is that tradition that we have that regardless of whatever darkness we're experiencing, that if you've booked a simcha, if there are moments for joy, um, even where there are edicts, as we'll be aware of, where there's a time to mourn and to reflect, that you never cancel a simcha, that uh, we should always delight in. In fact, as a community, we're required to join in uh, with simcha, even where there's the backdrop of the dark clouds of unhappiness. So l'chaim to everybody. And the second thing is it's a real privilege, uh, Rob, to be here because one of the ridiculous and obscene things that you get when you are on television, you have any kind of public platform is a capacity not just to do tzedakah, but to bring light and to bring attention to smaller charities. And that's especially important for me for charities that do their work and breathe life, breathe neshama into the land of Israel. I am a proud, out and unashamed Zionist. And one of the things that really matters to me is how we collectively as a community, both for us and beyond, become really good quality advocates for the state of Israel. And it seems to me that increasingly um, it's difficult to do that deploying logic, that nowadays it's very easy to deploy dark and nefarious anti-Semitic tropes online, but that's where the conversation is taking place. And when people have got those held views, or when people, for example, simply hold uh, uh, wrongful views about perhaps the history of the state of Israel, whatever they are, that we're no longer, I think, meaningfully able to engage with one another in a logical way. In other words, it used to be the situation where we'd sit and talk and I deploy a fact and you might disagree with it and you'd have a counter view and we may, having met each other with goodwill, depart potentially even as friends. That's becoming increasingly challenging. And so uh, the advocacy that I teach and the work that I make, uh, hopefully moving forward as well, you, you refer to the Holocaust documentary I made, but we're, we're hopefully uh, working on a documentary about Israel too, it is to think about this, uh, uh, listening and being able to hear whatever it is that somebody else says, a concern, even an anti-Semitic trope they might want to repeat about Israel, remembering that the way people feel about that state, as I say, doesn't sit in the logical cortex of their brain. It's in the emotional hemisphere where identity is governed. And so if I deploy a counterfact about 
how Israel was formed, um, very often people receive that as an attack on their identity and they stop listening. And that's a very long throat clearing to say what we really need as a community is really quality examples of who and what Israel is at its very best, both in terms of the communities, the range of communities it serves, um, its beacon as a Western liberal democracy and how it treats the weakest and the most vulnerable amongst those communities. And it seems to me that the Malki Foundation is perhaps one of the most articulate expressions of that. So when people come to me and they say, whatever it is they want to say about Israel, I may say, I hear what you say. And as a throat clearing, I'll correct them by deploying the correct facts. But I'll also say, I'd like to tell you a story. And one of those stories might be about the work of the Malki Foundation, just to give them an emotional sense of who we are as a people and what Israel is as a nation at its very best. So thank you for having me this evening, Rob. No, thank you, that, that's brilliant, that's amazing. So the idea of tonight, Rob, was you got loads of fans all over the place, as you know, and there's about 50 or, 50 or so of them here tonight, and people have got questions of all, on all site types of topics, and the idea was people are gonna throw their questions at you and try and not catch you out, but <laughs> get, get, there are going to be some legal ones and some fun ones. And we thought, if that's okay with you, we'll just go down that route and get, get people to... Ask whatever you like. <laughs> I'm open to all comers. Absolutely, what, what, whatever it was. Um, yeah. Amazing. Anything, I, I love Yiddish. No, no bubba masters. I'll do whatever. I'll, I'll be answering um, fully, uh, openly and honestly. So lovely to see inside people's houses. It is brilliant. It's one of the loveliest things about doing, uh, I know, I mean, uh, happily, I, uh, so far I'm looking, I mean, lovely Keith and Angela Levin, they seem to be somewhere, um, not quite in their house. You look like you, 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 perhaps a Von Trapp family are going to show up any minute, but there you are. <laughs> nice to see you. So Rob, we're anyway. going to... Right. The first question, we're going to, actually we're going to, so... Daniel Burke at 3D Solicitors very kindly is a, a, a big supporter of, uh, of the Malky Foundation and has been one of our, our sponsors. Thank you, 3D. Um, so I think we're going to go to Daniel with his question. Hi, right, well, uh, thank you and thank you for letting us sponsor this. Um, Malky's uh, father is a friend of mine and um, uh, we're, we're delighted to be uh, linked with such a, a special charity. Um, Robert, we, we deal with... Um, a lot of fake news and dishonesty about Israel, where those who are opposed to Israel aren't particularly interested in the truth or dealing with the truth. Uh, we have problems with um, misinterpretation of law. We've had issues with the dishonest way in which the ICC dealt with Israel recently. How, in your view, do we reclaim the term Zionism from against that background? That's a really good question, Daniel. Thank you. First of all, thank you as well to your firm sponsoring this incredibly uh, important charity. It's, uh, you know, uh, an important mitzvah to say the very least. Um, the answer is by getting better at it. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, Israel sits into a very neat um, international identitarian logic. That's a posh way of saying it fits nowadays. It fits very uncomfortably in a problematic space. Again, what does that mean? Well, Israel um, uh, was, as many people will remember, uh, a place that was championed by the political left right up until the end of the 1970s. Whilst it was, if you like, a home of victims and a plucky place of uh, kibbutzim, building a nation from scratch, of those who had been oppressed, it was one that the left could get on board with. As soon as it was able to stand on its own two feet, and now on the face of it, on the face of it, as it's become, um, and well, uh, certainly an industrial behemoth, uh, as it's a Western liberal democracy, as it seems to some easily to sit in uh, 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 the narrative as a client state of America, that makes, in a world where there is no nuance, and there's no nuance on social media at all, it makes it very easy for people to look at it and to assume that because it's the big guy, 
it ultimately must be oppressing the small guy. It makes in international legal terms, it very easy for people to make even the brightest amongst those international lawyers assumptions that um, regardless of what protections Israel puts in place before it takes action, um, that it should be judged to a wholly different standard. Um, and the answer to your question, it seems to me when I started was say we've got to get better at it. What I mean by getting better at it is we need to become better advocates, but not better advocates in frustration. We have to understand what the reality is. And those who would seek to attack Israel are really good at it because they've got a much easier narrative to sell. It's very easy to find pictures. And in many respects, it has to be said and it has to be accepted that there are instances of human rights abuses. Those are ones that go around the world and get disproportionately magnified. doesn't matter what your frustration is in response to that, that there are currently Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps or the attacks on Rohingya people, or the fact that Israel is held to a different standard. That might be an act of frustration, but that doesn't help in terms of responding. What we need to be able to do is to understand better how to become, as I say, not just advocates, but to understand the methodology by which those that would seek to undermine the state of the Israel, how they operate in that social media space and beyond. And as I said in my opening remarks, Daniel, the reality is that the facts, I'm afraid, um, are, are only part of the answer. So somebody that's got a deeply held view about Israel, very often it's because of their global view about power. And it's very easy, as I repeat, to look at the actions of Israel and to make a determination that because they're a state that now has power, uh, and can project massive military power, anything that they do or it does as a state must by virtue of what ensues that they must be wrong. And so how then do we find a way of speaking to people exactly as you ask and persuading them, not just of the legitimacy of the Israeli state, but how we find a way of reframing and reshaping those deeply held views? And two things I would say about that. The first one is every time you see one of these anti-Semitic tropes, every time you hear um, misfacts, deliberately, uh, falsely deployed, deployed information about Israel, it's very frustrating. And so consequently, in response, we tend to become really bad advocates because what we want to do, as you know, as a lawyer, is write or shout in angry reply. And that's easy to do because you have the truth at your fingertips, right? Which is perhaps the history of how the state evolved or, uh, and very often a response to what is and what are straightforward lies in many instances. I must emphasize that's not to say that the Israeli state is perfect and the government is currently uh, contains people who I find deeply odious, but that's by the by. In terms of the legitimacy of the state of Israel, the answer, as I say, is not in deploying the facts. It's finding ways that we can talk about Israel and share what it means to have a lived experience of being there. And so, Daniel, when somebody says to me or points at even false videos that are produced, for example, on social media, I have to do two things. The first one is I have to be able to let them know that I've heard what they've said, as difficult as that may be as challenging as that is, as offensive as that is to my sense of rightness, say, okay, I've heard that evidence. The next step is to say, well, that's a false video and here are the facts and this is what Israel does. And I know that that's not gonna land because the position that's held by people that have a strong view on this, as I said before, it sits in their identity. And so it seems to me what we need now more than ever are really good quality counter narrative stories about who and what Israel is as a state at its very best. Be that in the form of, for example, as I said, the Malki Foundation, Mokadov Adam, the form of Yesh Din, human rights lawyers that work tirelessly to bring, for example, human rights abuses to the attention of the world. The fact that this is a thriving liberal democracy, the way in which every building is cloaked, for example, in the LGBTQ flag on pride, and that freedom being not just a hardly fought and won one, but that it's one that's incredibly fragile, 
less than the difference from where I'm sitting today to South London is a difference between life and death for somebody being a member of that community. But the way that we frame that work, I'm afraid to say, um, hasn't been very thoughtful. And to an important extent, I do blame uh, the Israeli um, state for that. And it seems to me that one of the things they need to get better at, uh, I know, for example, uh, uh, the last ambassador was somebody who was infinitely more mindful about this than perhaps the current one, is um, understanding that those who seek to undermine and threaten the Jewish state are incredibly good on social media at framing that emotional narrative, and we are miles behind. And so it seems to me that as we rethink what Zionism is, I don't think we need to rethink it. What we need to do is to find new ways of explaining what it is, why it's there, and the value that it has both as a society now and to the world in the future. And we need to get better at doing that on social media. We need to find better examples and we need to become better advocates ourselves rather than getting angry and deploying logics that nobody or arguments that nobody's listening to. We need to use new media in a much more creative and innovative way. That's what I think. Brilliant. Great, great, great question. Great answer, Rob, thank you. Next up, we are going to go to, so this event was also in collaboration with UK Lawyers for Israel. You know, they're, they're, we've been working with them and it's been great partnering with them. And um, Caroline Turner has been the representative there and she's got a question for you as well. I think she might have a couple actually, Rob. So I'm gonna hand over to Caroline next. Uh, hi, Rob. Um, so- Good evening, Caroline. Hi. Um, so my first question is, have you ever experienced anti-Semitism personally? Um, it's really interesting. I, do you know, um, I, I hadn't. Um, and that's you, for a number of reasons. I, um, you know, I, uh, I'd never wore a kippah to court. A kippah to court. So um, I never had any of the outward vestiges of somebody uh, who, who was Jewish. I never hid my Judaism at all. Um, I never experienced it in school. I grew up in, in Southgate. It was a blended community with rich Jewish life. And I don't personally remember that. That being said, Carolyn, um, as you know, as a barrister, there's a, a very strictly applied, or it certainly was when I was practicing, a cab rank rule, uh, which meant that we couldn't turn down cases regardless of the political complexion or views of our clients. And I very early on uh, represented members of the National Front and I do remember a, a client saying to me how pleased he was that um, this particular solicitor hadn't sent him another yid to court, uh, <laughs> which I thought was um, interesting. It was, um, you know, it, I, it, it took every vestige of my self-control not to go, what makes you think I'm not Jewish? There you are. But, you know, the thing is, Carolyn, what also it taught me, um, when I ended up in the public eye, it, you know, you become the recipient of a malice of social media response. And there was never a single moment, even where I was confronted, usually I have to say it's by homophobia, not anti-Semitism, that I was ever troubled or concerned. None of it ever landed. It never wounded because once you've represented people that have got residual energy in their day for hate, and you've understood what that looks it, that looks like, what their lives are like. You can feel, certainly I could feel, nothing but really sorry for them. These are people that sat up all night, chain smoking parliaments and wearing moo-moos. There's no happiness in anybody that has hate in their heart. That being said, again, I should add that it's really interesting in response to what was happening in the Labour Party last year. I would post precisely the same, for example, tweets as somebody like Rachel Riley or Tracy Ann Oberman, just for example, or Luciana Berger. Uh, I would be roundly met uh, with the same audience. I would be roundly met with applause and support. Whereas, and this is where social media is desperately and frighteningly gendered, they would uh, meet a wall of anti-Semitism and misogyny, which I never experienced. Not at all. Okay, but it's a good news story. It's a good news story, I should say. Um, uh, uh, earlier, Rob referred to the Who Do You Think You Are and the documentaries. You know, in the Who Do You Think You Are, I was the least famous person that they, whose story they covered I I in that group. And more than 1.5 million people more 
watched the program that was made about the Shoah and Jewish um, refugee history in the UK. And the documentaries we made uh, with the BBC, over seven and a half million people have watched them. And the BBC take um, the research they do very seriously insofar as you can rely on their underlying methodology, which I don't think is great. But it wasn't just the ratings, the number of people who tuned in. It was also, we know from communities that either watch no BBC at all and certainly don't watch documentary. And they stayed with us and it was the most popular program the first week it went out. And there wasn't a peep of anti-Semitism on social media whatsoever. But this wide collective thirst to understand and to know more. And I think, you know, when I started this thinking about Simcha, it's very easy for us, or it's easy. I think that part of our survival instinct is to have a heightened level of anxiety around anti-Semitism, forgetting that we live in a country where there's a lot of good news. And amongst that good news, that's some of it. Well, well done on your documentary. It sounds amazing. Um, oh, on a completely different subject, um, what's your favourite place in Israel? It's a good question. Um, I was just on the funny. I was just on a meeting talking about Israel before. Um, well, I mean, I'm going to say Tel Aviv, but where in Tel Aviv is the problem? You know, um, so my warning you years ago used to be, I go like, the thing is, it's the best city in the world, but they can't do hotels. And the reason they can't do hotels is because Israel, Israelis don't know from service. And, you know, I, I've no shame in talking about this, um, but it's one of those things where it doesn't matter how much you're paying. I was in a very expensive hotel not long ago. I got a call in the middle of the night. It was four o'clock in the morning. I said, yes, I, I didn't order an early morning. I didn't early order a, an early morning call. Yes, you did. And then as I checked out of the hotel, um, I noticed on the bill, you know, it was a hundred dollars more than I, I said, I'm so sorry being, you know, you, you've charged a hundred dollars more than you should. Have. So it's a hundred dollars, you know, you know, it's, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the really exciting thing about uh, Tel Aviv uh, in the last 10 years, as you're probably aware, um, as is, as that it's become, I think more than any other part of somewhere that's sort of almost on the fingertips, beyond the reach of the fingertips of Europe, this dynamic, uh, pluralistic city that's the home of the greatest food and art and party and what I love about it as well it's incredibly democratic in an age where you know I mean not that I would go clubbing in London I'm you know I'm more let's party like it's 1899 but it's a city where you can walk around regardless of your age and feel included in the nightlife in the joy of being in the beach it has a ruach that I um, especially love um, that being said, um, you know, two other cities that need a shout out. One is Arad, which if you ever get the chance to drive on the way to Masada, I think is particularly magical, largely because a lot of the indigenous Arab population stayed there and live in harmony. And of course, it was where uh, the late Amos Oz was from, whose work uh, I admire greatly. Um, and I'm especially looking forward to the new hotel that they've opened in the Negev as well. I mean, where do we begin? I feel like Jerusalem is its own place. You know, it's it's too much of an easy, uh, it, it's too easy. And every time, I don't know if this is your experience, Karen, every time that you, you go to Jerusalem, you know, the threads that weave itself into that ancient and sacred tapestry change every time. You have a different experience. You find something new there every time. Um, and so it's not my favourite place to go. I often, it depends on, I suppose, what my emotional chemistry is and at the time that I'm there. But it, it, it's, a, you know, really quickly, I, I'll tell you, I, I used to be a, a human rights barrister and still a member of Chambers. And rather than taking people on a, a group tour, uh, from time to time, I used to take people who are a little bit sceptical, but sufficiently open-minded about Israel on the Rob Rinder tour of Israel. And, you know, we go to one of the parties in Tel Aviv and we might go to the Supreme Court and just happen to bump into uh, one of the non-Jewish Arab members of the Supreme Court and an Arab member of the Knesset that we might accidentally say hello to and we might end up in an LGBTQ nursery and we might end up deciding to walk up Masada with young uh, female members of the army. We might end up in a bar somewhere having a drink and me mentioning to the person this was blown up four or five years ago as I sit alongside female members of the military. And 
every single part of that country that's been built with the muscle and the sweat and the heart and the ruach and the neshama, the people who are there, you can feel it from the moment you get off the plane. So I wouldn't like to say which city I love best, but um, Tel Aviv is your answer. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you for a very uh, comprehensive answer. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Should I come to another ca- no, or should I stop there? I've got more questions. For yeah, you. they've got some new. The good news is that at the end of that <laughs> is apparently they've got some really good new hotels that open. Baruch Hashem, they're going to open, um, and they've even learned how to do service. I'm told. We'll see. <laughs> When are you going? Got any, anything booked or not yet? Well, I don't think we can book them unless you have an Israeli passport, so um, which I don't yet. So I'm hoping to go um, at the end of August. Okay, brilliant. Okay, I think I'm going to move on to uh, Amanda Jackson next. With our Amanda, you hi know? Amanda. Oh, she was. She was. Yes. Hello. Okay. Um, I'm here. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Um, so our paths have crossed many years ago. Um, I used to be Miss Moss and I taught you in Hebrew classes. So I just I, thought I'd uh, admit that. I remember you. I'm not even joking. I MS Hashem. I remember you. I absolutely were lovely. Uh, I'm yeah. pleased to hear Lovely it. Lovely to see you. Uh, please don't, I mean, I was... Thank you I, very much. You know, I always use Yiddish, I always use Yiddish in court, and sometimes I can't deploy it. Years ago when I used to do uh, magic straits court uh, uh, trials for, the, for young people, youth court cases, I wanted to say things like, he's not a bad kid, he's just a lobbyist. I can't imagine <laughs> what it must have been teaching me, Miss Moss. Um, well, it was... Uh, it was- a challenge I remember that yours was the class where I used to bribe you to keep quiet by telling you that I would tell you what had happened in neighbours at lunchtime because <laughs> <laughs> you used to come you used to come on the, uh, the midweek evening sessions I've got a little I've right, got a more yeah. light-hearted question <laughs> I've got a, a light-hearted question to ask you um, yes, which Ms. is Ford. one of the funniest things Please don't call me Miss Moss. I'm definitely Amanda these days. Um, one of the episode of the Michael Mac uh, yeah. when he Hello. Yeah, Rob, I think we're having a few technical issues with Amanda there, but basically, I, yeah, it was, I think I know Amanda's question was asking about whether, uh, do you want to repeat the question, Rob? Is, yeah, I think it's about when, Michael McIntyre, yes, isn't it? Yes, when Michael McIntyre came and woke you up in the night for the segment on his show, Amanda mm. wanted to know if that genuinely happened as it appeared on the programme, because it was one of the funniest things she'd ever seen on TV. Well, I'm glad that you laughed. Um, it genuinely did happen. Now, obviously, if somebody comes into your house without permission, that's burglary. And depending on the violence they do, it could be robbery as well. So about uh, six months before I gave them permission, but I wasn't entirely sure they were coming. And I'd had to do some difficult work and I struggled to sleep. So I'd had uh, a large amount of scotch. And what you didn't see was it took them about five minutes to wake uh, uh, me up. Uh, and then when I woke up in, in, in panic, I didn't have my glasses on. I couldn't understand what my auntie Adele was doing um, in my bedroom, as you saw, which, which they've, they cut a lot of it out, including the part when Sooty and Sweep started uh, uh, water pistoling me. But two things from a lot of the swearing got cut out. Two things. One was, as you saw, um, over the years, Miss Moss, I don't care. I, do you forgive me for not calling you Amanda? It's just not going to happen. Um, one thing that uh, was that over the years since university I, I've been privileged enough to meet lots of so-called kind of famous people um, including you know obviously famous actors I was at university with Benedict Cumberbatch and you know a, a people that you would know and consider to be very A-list but um, I'm never impressed by them because you know once you've after the initial flush of recognition what is there to talk about you, know, you can't wait to the soup arrive so that you can drown yourself in it. It's always enough about me. What do you think of me? I'm not interested. But the people, you've just mentioned neighbours, so I tell this story. The people that were famous when you were young, those are the people that you're really impressed by. 
or I certainly was. So as you saw, Zamo Maguire, Lee McDonald from Grange Hill broke into my house. And I was so overwhelmed, and you won't remember this, but I remember everything I read, or more or less, which sounds like a lovely skill to have, but uh, try sleeping uh, uh, with it. And the comment that I think you probably heard Michael McIntyre make, I was recounting the life story of this poor man that had broken into my house. Lee McDonald, Zamo Maguire from Grain Chelsea, he'd never seen um, the victim of a stalker break into their stalker's house. And the next thing that happened, and this is, I think, you know, there's many ways in which I suppose you, 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 if somebody describes what it means to be Jewish, perhaps part of it is this, they came in like a whirlwind and they left like a hurricane. And the first thing I thought when they disappeared from the house after I worked out was, oh my God, I didn't offer any of them anything to drink or eat. I felt terrible. That's how you... <laughs> It's lovely to see you, Miss Moss. That's um, that's that's done my heart good. I and I I really do remember you very fondly. I was going to say, um, got, and I remember you too. Mm. So we we've got one thing in common. We both went to Queen Elizabeth Boys School. So ah. I I was wondering what your memories of school are like and what sort of pupil you were. Probably not very good. I I didn't love uh, uh, Q Boys, uh, but I think when what what year did you finish there, uh -huh. Rob? I'm five years younger. Roughly. I, I don't know, so. But I was a year ahead. Yeah. About sort of 2000-ish. Yeah, 98, 99, I guess. Yeah. I think yeah, that was so great. I, I left there in about nine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was going to say. I, I think it's a wonderful school. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't much of a rugby player. I think it's a wonderful school. And... Right. Yeah, no, I certainly wasn't a, a, a rugby player and it didn't have much. I mean, it had a bit of drama and I, I got into National Youth Theatre from there and I... I, I met a couple of uh, mentors there. There were certainly weren't teachers. Um, and I did some drama, as I say, but no, I couldn't catch a ball if it had glue on it. Um, yeah, I mean, I did everything as a, as a mitzvah to my father to say I had polio on, on rugby day, but, um, but I decided not to. A risky joke, but there you are. But the point is this, that uh, it was an academic school that at the time, and I know it's changed up, lacked um, the cultural range and imagination and certainly then it was a type of school which chiefly sought as a mission to deliver boys that were going to go on to become management consultants. Mm. And, and that strike, struck me then, and uh, it doesn't now so much as the kind of apotheosis of their ambitions for the boys, you know, that they would leave and work in a bank and perhaps could be ordered. But, but it, it, it wasn't terribly imaginative. And also to be honest with you, Rob, um, I didn't suit the condition of childhood very well. So the idea of going as, as Miss Moss will tell you, and of course we've got some that can give evidence to that effect here tonight. So the idea of finding myself conscripted into a school with rules, with sizes of briefcases and that sort of thing, it wasn't going to go terribly well for either party. And I think on balance, um, they came off worse than I did. Mm. <laughs> um, Okay, great. Um, so I've got a question here from a lady called Roz. Um, her question is, so her daughter moved into a flat three years ago under the help to buy pay, paying rent and mortgage. And she mm -hmm. her daughter and all the other residents found out that the building has flammable cladding still. And she mm -hmm. can't understand why the actual builders aren't liable to change the cladding. Uh, it's still on the guarantee right. of the NHBC. And she was just wondering yeah. what your thoughts are on that. It's a really terrible scandal. And I have, um, in fact, colleagues going through the same thing. And the answer is watch this space. I can't give legal advice, but I suspect there's going to be, uh, as you know, um, there are issues that are still being dealt with in part two um, of the Grenfell inquiry. Mm. Um, it's a, that just so people understand the, the nature of the question, where the government in effect have uh, edicted or said that the, uh, uh, cladding that's on a private building has to be replaced because it's unsafe and it's not the fault of the people that have purchased leaseholds but they've made that a self and a health and safety requirement for a building how can it then be the responsibility of the owners of that building um, when uh, 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 they couldn't and shouldn't have known that there was going to be a change in the law um, I think that it seems to me that there's some there's cross-party support and I won't be surprised if in the next year there'll be legislation which will enable um, some sort of insurance payout there. But I, I, I don't know, it's still an ongoing legal problem. 
and there are a number of good campaigning groups that are on board. I can't comment on it because actually there are a number of live legal disputes at the moment, some of which are working themselves up to the Supreme Court, I believe. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but she needs to create a group and fight, definitely. Okay, excellent. Thank you. We're, we're, Ros will take that on board, I'm sure, and pass it over to her daughter. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Mr. Keith uh, Le Levin. Um, he asks, um, are you still practicing at the bar? And have you had any professional problems with the bar council as a consequence of your TV show, Judge Rinda? No, that's a good question, Keith. Um, I, I am still a member of my chambers. And my chambers is very serious. I'm very proud of it. I mean, it's probably there are perhaps three chambers, maybe four, that uh, are in, in criminal, international criminal terms called, called the, the, the golden, if you like, they're called the golden, well, circle of, 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 of sets. And I, I'm in one of them to head court and they've always been enormously supportive. Uh, no, I haven't had any difficulty with the bar council. I'll come on to your first question in a second. The reason for that is because firstly, what I do um, uh, sits outside of their remit, but also because part of the reason I didn't get eviscerated either by the bar standards board or by my colleagues was, although of course there's an element of theater and pantomime to a degree in some of the cases, at the heart of every case is the law. And even where the cases, and the questioner will know this, where the subject matter is really silly, sometimes the law can be really difficult. Uh, people listening might be aware that one of the most important cases in English law is about two women who are having lunch, excuse me, were having a lunch one day in the 1930s. And one poured a ginger beer bottle into a glass, it poured the ginger beer into a glass, and there was a masticated snail. And um, the question was, once that woman had passed out after an attack of the vapours because she was so horrified about that masticated snail, who could she sue? And until that point, at the beginning of the last century, there was no one she could sue because she didn't have a contract with anybody. She just purchased this ginger beer bottle. Well, that case went on to become what's called Donahue and Stevenson. And it worked its way right up to the Supreme Court. And the lead judge in that case asks this philosophical question, who is my neighbor? A philosophical question that would trouble Talmudists of, of old, of some of the great minds of our and previous generations, all because of that tiny little issue. And some of my cases, including the ones that involve goats that eat the contents of people's handbags, etc., some of the ones that are the funniest, often involve the most complex issues of law, and I take that really seriously. And because of that over however many years, and the fact that they've seen that I take that really seriously, and because um, I practiced for way over a decade dealing, and I repeat, with serious and complex law, I hadn't been there for five minutes. Um, I think to that extent, um, I, I, I was, if you like, given the benefit of the doubt. In terms of practicing, I, I practice pro bono at the moment. So I'll do free legal advice for litigants in a variety of cases, but I can't do the previous work I was doing, mainly because I was advising foreign governments. So part of that job, for example, might be, as it was before I started Judge Rinder, might be advising the government of Jersey on policy. There was a case that I was dealing with um, involving the Joint Independent Care Inquiry in Jersey, which was a long investigation they had into historical uh, sex abuse allegations. And one of the concerns they had, which was a, 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 a right concern, was that there wasn't a separation between the legislative and the prosecutorial branches of government because it's Jersey and it's a small place. So what they do in those circumstances is they hand over the keys to somebody like me uh, to write the policy and to make sure that the inquiry has all of the material it needs at arm's length from the government. And you'll write the policy and you'll make sure that that happens. And that was a type of work I would do. And um, often it's complex and you are ultimately liable and responsible for it. Well. You can imagine what would happen if I was still practicing that sort of law and something went horribly wrong and one of the senior judges asked uh, an advocate an advocate or a senior barrister in the course of a case, whose silly idea was it not to disclose this great big wadge of material? And the answer is, well, I'm awfully sorry, my Lord. Um, he's off doing the cha-cha-cha. So for that reason, I try to keep it uh, uh, as, uh, as, as, as quiet as I possibly can. Also, uh, in jury trials, I can't practice jury trials because it would be unfair uh, for obvious reasons. Okay, amazing. So following on from that then, as your days as a legal practitioner, 
what would you say is your most horrifying, embarrassing, or amusing court memory? From Judge Rinder or from, from my practice, days of practice? Yeah, days of practicing, I think. They, uh, this there are is too many from my days of practice. I mean, horror, I mean, those are, I mean, I, we, we would be here um, all night. You, you wanted um, horrifying, what was the other one? Amusing. Um, That's horrifying. what you call a compound question there, Mr. Tao. <laughs> <laughs> you can just go with one of them, which, which, whichever one you, you, you which, want to take on. Which one do you want? Okay. Um, what, well, what? Um, horrify, horrifying and amusing. Um, uh, horrifying, there's too many to describe. I used to practice uh, in criminal defence and after three or four years was defending chiefly in murder cases. And so there are innumerable numbers of issues that I dealt with, which were very, very challenging indeed. What I will tell you, however, is that in nearly every case that I ever dealt with, the person, the human being sitting opposite me on the other side of the table, was never to excuse what that particular individual had did. But you could always either empathize or objectively understand the series of events that had led that person to be on the other side of the table from where you were. And often people that had committed the worst offences were a complex range of different things, funny, challenging, very often very clever. Perhaps the worst case I did, and I dealt with uh, multiple homicides, cases involving genocide, but the one that sticks with me, I talked about not long ago. Um, I dealt with a case involving gang violence in, in, in Birmingham. And uh, the two big gangs there were called the Burger Bar and the Johnson Crew which I know um, coming back to Miss Moss sounds a bit like Grange Hill, but they're extremely lethal. And on one occasion in the summer, excuse me, in the, on New Year's Eve in 2002, 2003, my client was alleged to have been standing at a party and um, denigrating the other gang, the Burger Bar. And so the Burger Bar found where he was and unloaded a MAC-10 semi-automatic weapon and two girls were killed in the crossfire. Um, I represented the man who had started the series of those horrifying events, and he was subsequently acquitted. The reason I tell you that story, because actually wasn't the worst case I dealt with, not, not by a long stretch, except the witnesses in that case were participating informants. In other words, they were gang members who had agreed to give evidence on the basis of anonymity. But they weren't just given anonymity, given how serious and lethal the gangs were. They were given uh, witness, state-sponsored witness protection for life. Uh, in fact, so much so that we as lawyers were allowed to see their faces, but the defendants could only hear the evidence that was being given by these informants through voice distortion equipment whilst in the dock, and they couldn't see their faces. We as lawyers were specifically injuncted, prevented from saying anything to our own clients that would lead to the identity of those witnesses. That's how serious it was. Yeah. Now I fast forward, my client was acquitted in that case, uh, but I had a young man who was uh, about 18 years old uh, with special educational needs that hadn't been adequately diagnosed. And one night the police raided his house and they found guns all over the place in shoe boxes in his mum's room. They probably weren't his, uh, he was connected to the gang by his sister, who was going out with somebody very serious in that organisation. We had a very difficult choice to make. The law, this law is no longer available to a defendant, but it was then, which was for him to run a case of duress, which was what he said was the truth. In other words, I only kept these guns because otherwise they threatened my life. The difficulty with that case is that if he ran that case of duress to a jury, he had to identify, disclose, who the people were who threatened him in the first place. And bearing in mind how serious these gangs were and the protections offered to prosecuting, or excuse me, prosecution witnesses, none of those protections were available to a defense witness, somebody who was there simply to stand up and tell the truth about what happened. But if he didn't tell that story, he would have got 10 years in prison. His mother and I persuaded him correctly to tell the truth, which is what happened. It's an easy case to run as defence counsel because you call the prosecution witnesses, 
who will tell the jury just how lethal and violent the gangs are. That's what happened. And this young man who in different hands, in a different environment, perhaps in a different community with access to help, would have had a different outcome. But he gave his evidence beautifully and honestly and the jury believed him and he was acquitted on the Monday. He didn't name an individual, but he did name the gang that he said had forced him to put these weapons in his room. And that was a Monday when he was acquitted after the speech I made to the jury. And on the Thursday, I got a telephone call from his mom saying that he'd been shot dead outside his house. And I know for sure, without question, that he would still be alive today, but for him running that trial in that way. So that's the most horrifying one. Um, in terms of amusing ones, there are too many to mention. One of the real challenges is that um, it's often impossible not to laugh. Uh, when I first started, now over two decades ago, there used to be a very big court in Southwark with one of these snaggletooth Wickhamist judges, you know, very grand and all the rest of it. And they used to have a day of pleaders and you do three, four, even five cases. And I had my case, you'd sit down and then you'd prosecute a case. And they brought a man in. Uh, this was at a time when the Obscene Publications Act was still relevant. And they had arrested him for having um, naughty videos, I think is the best way of describing it. And the clerk of the court unusually is very posh in that court. So I knew what was coming and I was with a friend of mine who's now a QC who was doing a mini pupillage. He was doing work experience at the time. And so they said, is your name John Smith to this poor man wearing the Mac and the comb over the resident? Yes, yes, that's me. Did you have in your video, did you have in your possession a video contrary to the Obscene Publications Act between such and such a date and another date? Naughty schoolgirls and et cetera. And I started to laugh. And then, of course, as the titles became more and more horrifying, I ended up laughing so much that I wet myself in court. And um, my friend ran, ran out. I think uh, it was the last title that particularly um, did it. And in terms of a, a strange and amusing clients, which answers, I think, the three questions you have. Um, I remember one of my favorite moments, again, when I first started, you do 10 cases sometimes in the magistrate's court, it's all changed. But I had a marvellous, rather noble um, prostitute called Gloria, who, as my grandma said, Kanena Horror at the time was 78 years old. And um, she used to take a shining for a young barrister, and that just happened to be me. And so at the time, again, the law has changed, but she would be prosecuted for solicitation. And I got a call, one, I worked on a Shabbat morning, I used to do it time to time, and they would all be in the cells in Bow Street Magistrates, which is now a block of flats. And I went to see Gloria, now um, 78, didn't look a day over 78. And I saw on the charge sheet that she had been, or she was there that morning, having been prosecuted for shoplifting. And I said, Gloria, um, I don't understand what's going on. I mean, you know, have you given up the game? And she looked at me and she said, yes. I said, well, what, what's going She said, well, you know, Rob, the stairs which I think about often, really. <laughs> amazing, amazing. That's brilliant stories. Um, so we've got another question from uh, David Harris. Um, what is mm. your view in general on the quality of the reporting by the press and TV of high profile and contentious legal cases? For example, he gives the withdrawal of life support for a terminally ill child or adult oh, lack of questions or issues of major constitutional importance. Such a good question. Um, the answer is um, with the notable and proud exception of Joshua Rosenberg, who's brilliant. And in fact, he got an honorary silk um, and one or, few, one or two other honorable mentions. Um, it's terrible. Uh, it doesn't deal with the nuance. I, I mean, I've probably dealt with, I'd say five or six cases, which have either had national and a couple of cases sort of international interest. And it's difficult because journalists have to write in a disciplined style in a certain number of words. But certainly in criminal cases, I've rarely had um, a case which has been even vaguely kind of correctly reflected in the journalism. Again, that's understandable. What will happen is that, you know, just uh, uh, very often it will be distorted through the prism of the sexiest part of the evidence, ignoring the more important bits. 
And often the journalists will either misrepresent or misunderstand a, a court procedure. And uh, that has an enormous social cost. So so-and-so gets bail. And it, well, there is a presumption in favor of bail and these are the reasons, the legal reasons why that's the case. Or they'll talk about someone getting a horrifyingly low sentence without explaining the broader context of the person's mitigation, for example. And as I say, my personal experience, I have rarely dealt with a case that's been uh, well written up in, in the press or uh, 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 is a piece of journalism that's a public service and better helps people understand the legal process. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Um, we got another one from uh, another Carolyn. Um, so she says, we've been assured that it is easy, necessary and straightforward to apply for power of attorney online. Would you? The nightmare. <laughs> yes, it's getting better, it's, but it should be much more simple. It's, it's ridiculous. First of all, it shouldn't cost as much as it costs. Secondly, it should be streamlined. Thirdly, there should be a dedicated court that does nothing but that sort of ad administration. And um, I understand why there needs to be protections in place to avoid uh, abuse and people finding themselves a subject of duress and that sort of thing. Um, and yes, you can do it yourself. That being said, you know, if I'm honest, the reality of the situation now is I would still put a will, even one you made online, I would still put power of attorney documents under the nose of a qualified lawyer and solicitor, however streamlined it is at the moment. It's not yet at a stage where in my judgment, it's safe enough to do entirely on your own, but it needn't be expensive. I should also add, it's an enormously wise thing to do. And also to have a very clear letter of wishes, both in your will and on your power of attorney. Um, can I come back to that lovely question somebody asked before about the media? You know, very often what happens is that cases get split into two characters. So for example, the person, the person that asked that question asked a very interesting question about the way in which um, uh, 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 the media reported, for example, an application that will be made by a hospital or a local authority acting um, as an intervening party in a case of treatment for a child. You know, we live in an age where, um, a sort of tyrannical age where there's no room for nuance. Those cases are incredibly nuanced. And often what happens in the reports is you have goodies and baddies. It is the hospital or the doctors or the local authority trying to stop this plucky family from getting the treatment a child needs. When often, in fact, nearly in every case, in fact, in every case, these are really difficult, complex, emotional cases where every single person involved in those proceedings doesn't just take them seriously, but has thought about them in a really deep, authentic and heartfelt way. That's not what you see, of course, when it's printed. You know, it's printed it, I get, again, inevitably through the um, medium of goodies and baddies, right and wrong, good and bad, when nearly all cases are complex shades of grey. Yeah, of course. OK, great. So I, I'm sure a lot of people probably saw you on uh, TV last night on the Ready Steady Cook for Red Nose. I haven't watched it. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> do, you, do you enjoy cooking? Is yeah, What no. food do you like to make or...? No, you felt no, no. Rob, Rob, I, I have no transferable skills whatsoever. I mean, I speak Russian. And I've realised in this lockdown, I'm sorry, I'm worried about Miss Moss's face, you know, what she's going to say. But I have to say, I, I um, it's not my line, but I've realised in the event of a war or some really big national crisis of that sort, I'll have to be a hostage. Useless, completely useless. I did, however, you know, somebody asked about the nature of my Jewish family and what my grandparents who have two grandmas, uh, as I say, BHS, Baruch Hashem is still alive. And I thought I'd give one of them the respect, the covet of asking her how to make a chicken soup. And this says everything about Jewish grandmahood. So she told me how to do it and I did it. And uh, she phoned me up the next day. She was thrilled. She was schlepping knuckles that I had asked her how to make her chicken soup. You know, she phoned every female relative that I'd ever known to tell them that I'd asked her how to make her chicken soup. The next day she telephoned me, she said, well, how did it go? And um, it was a disaster. The chicken was so hard. I said, Grandma, the chicken's rock hard. And she, without missing a breath, said, you take that shizzle back to the butcher. They've sold you an old hen. That's about uh, the, 
the the extent of my cooking skills. The reason I went and did Ready Steady Cook, I'll tell you why. This is a true story. Um, it's an interesting thing and it's a reflection on lockdown as well. You know, at the two bookends of our lives, when we're young, we're really connected to excitement, looking forward to going out to birthdays, Hanukkah, whatever it is, Simchas. As we get older, uh, in, the, in the middle periods of our lives, I think we, we lose that sense of excitement. And yet, as we get a bit older and the world shrinks a little, you know, I remember my grandma looking forward to a friendship club or perhaps a Simcha in a year's time, much like Maureen Lippmann, telephoning people around, vetoing anyone else wearing taupe. It's all very exciting. In lockdown, to be honest with you, um, when somebody telephoned and said, would you like to get into a taxi, a machaya? Would you like to get on a train for six hours? Double machaya. I said, yes. It wasn't until I got on the actual train I realized what I was actually doing, and it was for charity. Um, <laughs> but the poor chef, I haven't watched it back. Uh, and, and nearly all of the things that he asked me to do, I do the crossword every, I'd only ever heard of in crosswords. I do, my oven gets used for storage. I did um, Celebrity Bake Off last mm. year. And uh, there's a thing, I again, I hadn't really watched it. And um, it said something in the instructions about you had to prove your dough, it said. I don't know on earth it meant. I knew it was a cross, I knew sort of what it meant vaguely. It was connected to bread because it's always in the cryptic crossword. But I thought, I'm looking at this, you know, thing that I'd vaguely made that looked like a hate crime, ask, thinking to myself whether I had to ask it questions about its witness statement. <laughs> totally useless. Uh, brilliant. Um, I'm conscious of, of the time. Um, is, is, you, you're doing another series of Judge Arinda and do you have any other projects on the horizon? You mentioned something about an Israel program. You're, you're yeah. Doing. Is there anything you so, can So several, really. Yeah, I mean, so well, one thing, if you really want to, um, I... Um, in the spirit of agreeing to do anything that would get me out of the house, Rob, um, I agreed to do um, a, a musical show, which is this weekend at six o'clock. So I did National Youth Theatre years ago. I was no good. I gave up acting. Uh, I think it's a well-known story. When I got to university, I thought I was sort of OK. And then somebody read the same part I did. And I thought, mm, yeah, that's that's the real deal. And that was Benedict Cumberbatch. After that point, I didn't think there was much point but in lockdown I have a piano and I, I've been singing and I used to sing when I was a kid so I thought great I'll I'll, I'll do this so um, on Sunday night you'll see it's a competition the outcome of what happened I don't want to say too much about it um, but uh, it was quite an experience what Sunday at six o'clock the serious work that I'm making obviously Judge Rinder uh, hopefully will continue it's impossible to make in lockdown for obvious reasons both to keep the litigants and the audience safe. Um, I'm going to America where we're going to try and perhaps make some of the court shows there. But the work that I really care about um, at the moment um, was in fact, and, and forgive me, uh, I, I answered it in far too long a fashion, was from the, 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 the uh, our sponsor who asked the first question tonight. Um, so, um, What's been really fascinating has been the response that we've had to the Holocaust documentary. And as I say, communities uh, beyond the borders of London that are really sort of interested in learning and understanding more and ways that we can engage with one another by telling human stories. So the next piece of work that I'm really looking to make and hopefully um, can get funding from the BBC, fingers crossed, as I say, Baruch Hashem moving forward, is to make a program about uh, what happened in 1948 in Israel um, and to tell that story, but to tell it from the point of view of uh, the Jews of color from Mesopotamia, a story we don't hear about those who walked across the earth from Egypt and parts of Iraq from the Yemen to the land, the Holocaust survivors who didn't just join the Agun but lived on beaches in, in Haifa, but also to tell the other side of that story, not a political story, but to ask the simple question as we do at the beginning, the beginning of any mediation, why is this important to you? Human stories are a really um, enabling way of doing that. You know, you might often, you might see conflict on my program but before the cameras go on. I always say to them, especially if it's a toxic family conflict where often, in fact, nearly always, it's never about the money. It's about years of hurt and upset that this is an opportunity for both sides to hear one another, under strict rules, but to hear one another. And I think that's a sort of critical starting point, certainly when it comes to understanding uh, 
what the state of Israel is and why on both sides people feel so passionately about the land. And rather than having documentaries which turn people off, as I said earlier, the best starting point is to allow those human stories to sing for themselves. So that's hopefully uh, the next the, the 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 next the next project. But uh, but we we shall see. I'm also going around Russia with Alan Carr. But uh, we'll, we'll we'll see. Really great TV. That'll be amazing. And uh, you said the, the, the we'll show, see we'll see the show on the weekend the music we show what where where would we be able to see that on ITV at six o'clock. I, I I it's one of those things I. Um, I, I wouldn't encourage anyone to watch it. I, I, I will be under the my bed with my eyes shut. Um, it's like those moments, uh, you know, so when I used to pray during my bar mitzvah lessons when the great Sadiq who taught me, um, Aubrey Goldstein, and uh, I used to knock, at, used, to, used to press the flat button door and pray that he wasn't in that week. That's how I feel like as this, pr this show approaches. Uh, you know, oh, I haven't practised. <laughs> we, we wish you the best and you'll, you'll be brilliant uh, rob thank you so much for your time tonight i'm it's I'm, been a privilege. I'm gonna hand over to caroline just to say thank you as well and thank you to everyone mm. for all your questions and thank you rob thank you for having me it's been a real as i say it's a real privilege you know the more um we as a community can do to support charities like the malky foundation the more we have a better and more enabling platform to speak about what Israel is at its very best and who we are um, as a community and as communities that are the rich tapestry of Israel. So thank you for having me. Um, yeah, thank, thank you so much, Rob, for giving me your time and participating in this uh, great event to help the Malki Foundation. Um, um, just before we end, I wanted to say a few words about UKLFI Charitable Trust and what we do. Um, we're a group of lawyers whose mission is to counter anti-Semitism, particularly anti-Semitism relating to Israel. And we do this by providing legal advice and help to victims of anti-Semitism. Um, for example, we helped a student victim of anti-Semitism at SOAS to win a substantial compensation and we've helped to ensure Israeli speakers can go ahead at Israel Society events at different universities. And we've prevented discrimination against Israeli sports teams in international events, um, including the Paralympic swimming. Um, we also provide education regarding Israel and the law. <clears throat> we've got legal resources on our website and we arrange webinars on subjects which have in the last few weeks included um, the psychology of terrorism, whose responsibility is Palestinian healthcare, and fighting terrorism while respecting international law. Um, and you can find out more on our website, which is uklficharity.com. Chari so just thanks again to everyone who's attended and contributed to this webinar and to Rob Taub and the Malky Foundation and again to Rob Rinder. Thank you everybody and good night. Bye.